Welcome to another episode of the Empowered Half Hour. And today's guest is, he's like super awesome is because he specializes in meditation. And you guys know that I am a meditation nerd. And with the busy world that we live and work in, to have a meditation guru on here, I am just thrilled. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Richard Dixie, and he is the author of Three Minutes a Day, and I'm holding it up in the screen. This book is so awesome, and the format I'm thrilled with, but we'll get more into that. Richard, thank you for coming on the show. Welcome. My pleasure. Thank you to you. <laughs> Thanks. So I gave a short description of you, but would you share a little bit more about yourself and your background with the audience? Yeah, sure. I'm a scientist trained and I actually ran a laboratory for many years and then I ran a biotech company. But all through that time, there was this interest in meditation and in other ways of knowing that you don't really get from science. Science is wonderful, but it doesn't give you a complete picture of what it is to be a human being. And I discovered actually pretty from the very beginning, I had an interest in Buddhism, but it was only later on when I met a teacher that I really synced with that I totally engaged with the Asian meditation traditions. And the Asian meditation traditions are amazing because they're unbroken. They represent an unbroken lineage that goes back at least two and a half thousand years. It's something really unusual in humanity. None of the Western lineages are- are Yeah, that's really incredible. And so I then got interested in meditation and I was very fortunate that I met the eldest daughter of a Tibetan Lama, a very important Tibetan teacher called Tartang Rimshe. I married her in 2002 and- we lived in London for a while, and then we came to America to bring up our kids here to, and to be close to her father. So I've also had a lot of interaction with the Tibetan tradition over the years. And my wife and I also run a charity in India, which looks after the Theravadan tradition. So I've had a lot of interaction with them as well. So I've managed to interact with a lot of meditation teachers. There were a couple of things that came out. One is that although the Theravadan school, and this is the so-called mindfulness school, this is a terrible name for it, and it's completely inaccurate stress much longer periods of meditation. The Tibetans don't actually at all. They like very short insight moments and then you stop. And there are reasons for that, which I can get into if we have the time. Anyway, so I landed up running a college with my wife called Dharma College, where I'm senior senior faculty. And the idea of the college is to bring these Asian teachings into a relationship with Western culture and contemporary culture and drop all the technical language and all that kind of stuff. And it was in the course of teaching meditation in these classes, the idea of this book came out, and then some of the people are in the classes to make transcripts, into the transcripts, it's the book. That's how it happened. There's so much in what you said, and I don't know which nugget I want to pull through first, but I do like that you had mentioned that you don't need to meditate a lot. Because as we were prepping for this episode, I was sharing with you that a lot of listeners are probably have like a spiritual tendency to them, but they're also in the middle of their work lives, right? And so there's this preconceived notion that meditation might be hard. They don't have the time for it. They need a meditation pillow. I like in your book how you even said like you can find a chair. I like that you bring a simplicity to the Western culture. So anyway, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that, but I really like how you went into that in your book. No, I'm really keen to talk about that, actually. So the key thing is to understand what meditation is for. Because meditation was developed in these Asian traditions, largely in monastic communities where people were full-time monks. So obviously for them to meditate hours at a time was the same day job. (laughs) That's what they do. So so that wasn't an issue. But when you come into contemporary culture, it's very, very different. And people, A, don't have the hours of the day. And B, why are they doing it at all? And this is really where the nub of the whole book is and the nub of what we're trying to achieve. So it's this. We're born into the world. The world pre-exists us. We know that because our eyes pop open and there it already is. But we're not given an instruction manual of any sort. And we just have to kind of put it together for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that process of putting it together is largely accidental. It depends on where we were born, how rich our parents were, what kind of education we have, what happens to us. All kinds of complete Mm -hmm. accidental and random things go together to make up our worldview. Now, the thing is, the way we are educated, particularly in contemporary culture, is that there is a, quote, real world out there. And we're just some kind of uninteresting, passive observer of this thing with the real stuff's outside us. This is utterly ridiculous. It is. Totally untrue. And the real world is in here. And the reason is because all we ever and all we ever can experience are the five gates of our senses, 
and the gaze of the mind, the so-called six senses. There are no other ways we can interact at all. So if we're completely unaware of how we generate the five senses and the mind, if we're unaware of what those things are doing, what those six inputs, what in the meditation traditions is called the six gates, mm -hmm. if the six gates are completely unconscious to us, we are fundamentally unable to fully understand our lives. And we never will. And unfortunately, yes. our educational systems are all based on inference away from the primary data that we receive. So right. meditation is really about can I access experience as experience? Not can I experience something else, but can I access experience as experience? And the answer I is, of course, you can. And if you do, big things happen. Yes, I love that you said that because I have a personal experience I can share with you. I mean, in the prep for this, I share with you that I'm a Kundalini yoga teacher. So I have in Kundalini, we do anything from a one minute meditation up to hours. <laughs> so I've done the whole gamut. But what I found fascinating in my own exploratory, I've been meditating since 2006 and have done various types. But what I wanted to say is there was a period of time within the last five years that my stress levels were really high. I was meditating with the intention to reduce my stress, which caused me more stress. And then, so this is what I was saying about the experience. I like that you're talking about this and I kind of want to open this up because meditation really is not complicated and it's scary to people sometimes. But what I realized is shortly into the experience, it was like one of my practitioners was like, oh, do a de-stress meditations, whatever. And so I'm always willing to experiment. But what I realized is when I was sitting with the intention to de-stress, I was stressing more. And then I went back to my years of meditating and I was like, wow, I've had some really, I would say cosmic experiences where that internal experience helped me align with myself. I knew my truth. I knew how to clarity came. You talk about clarity in your book. I understood what decisions I needed to make, but they would come to me softly and subtly. And I was like, wow, I should be meditating to vibrate with the cosmos, not to de-stress. So a kind of a longer story, but I think it's probably relevant to a lot of the listeners. So I would love for you to share your take on that. Sure. The problem with meditation is most people meditate in the idea of meditation. Yes. Even the eight hour meditators do it. They have an idea that they're going to get, quote, enlightened, whatever that is. And they have this idea. So consequently, they sit in a thought. The thought is very mm. subtle, but it's the intent to get enlightened. That is a huge obstacle to actually meditating because meditation is about engaging with sense input directly without an intention of any sort apart from that engagement. That in itself is not a thought. You can look at thought, but you won't be a thought. Now, this comes, this is why I describe meditation a bit like a dance. Obviously, yes. you've got to do it. So you have to follow, quote, instructions. But those instructions are literally like someone walking down a mountain as you walk up and the guy says, oh, around the next bend, there's a great view. You don't have to look at the view. You're not obligated to look at the view. It's just good to know that there's a view around the bend. And that kind of lightness is important. Otherwise, you get stuck in thought. Now, we actually are mapping the world all the time. That's what's going Makes on sense. in our cognition. It's about 20 times a second we generate a cognitive map. Bang, 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 bang like this. And that's how we capture movement, whilst at the same time, freezing it into things. Now, there aren't actually no things. Things are concepts that we construct, that we lay on top of our sense inputs and say, oh, it's one of those. We actually have in our language a very interesting word. It's called recognition. When you recognize, you say, oh, I know what that is. Now, in that process, we are recognizing. We're actually applying a memory to a cognitive event. Okay. And quote, knowing it and that process of application, that recognitive process takes about 400 milliseconds and happens the whole time. So we're about four tenths of a second behind events the whole time living in a map. Now, because wow. we're so used to this map, it developed as we were babies and we developed it with our education, et cetera, et cetera. We call it the world. And we actually say, oh, I'm here and now in the world. No, actually, we're here and now in a map. And there's the problem. We can't see it because we don't realize it's a map. Right. So what meditation does is it says, okay, 
we're going to take one of the six gates. It doesn't actually matter which. And in fact, in the book, I go through four of the six gates. So, or, you know, people always think, oh, you've got to meditate on your nose. Oh, you've just got to meditate on one of the six gates. That's all. And we start off actually with the visual gate in the book. You simplify down to one of the gates and you merely observe it. And what happens as you do this is you begin to separate yourself from your map of knowing. I, the thing you observe starts to be itself, not what you quote think it is. Yes. That is a big moment when that occurs. Then the meditation pathway is to initially stabilize that relationship. Now that involves understanding concentration. And one of the really helpful insights that comes from the ancient traditions is concentration is not a single event. Now we have all Westerners and all contemporarily educated people can concentrate. Oh, Johnny, concentrate. <laughs> we kids be what we think concentration is, is to narrow our focus and stick on something. Technically, it's called adverting. This is where advertising comes from as a word. It grabs our attention and makes us look at something. Adverting. But adverting is very brittle. The problem with adverting is that you fix your concentration on object. Another sound happens or another thought happens. Oh, we're advert to that. And we advert to this and we advert to that. So we're being dragged around by our inability to control our concentration properly. It's brittle. Now, in maternity... With mm -hmm. incredibly sophisticated computer programs and devices that have happened in the last 20 years, our attention is being captured more and more and more. And people's stress levels are going up and up and up because yes. they're being dragged this way and that by cleverly designed devices. Now we have chat GBT. It's going to be very, very difficult. So what we have to do is we have to learn that adverting is not the whole of concentration. The metaphor is simple enough. You take a cup of coffee. You lift it to your lips. That's concentration. Then you taste the coffee. That's a different faculty. That's not merely concentration. That's savoring. You are savoring the coffee. Now, that difference between adverting and savoring is an extremely important difference to understand. And once you learn to savor, you can become stable in your concentration. In fact, this, we get yeah. into this immediately in the book. The second series of exercises are working with a bell where the sound yeah. is initially an adverted bing, there it is, fades. And as the sound fades, you start savoring the fading sound until eventually you're in total silence, but you're concentrated. Now, as you develop familiarity with savoring, your concentration becomes more and more stable because when you savor experience, Nothing can disturb it because when another element comes along, it's merely incorporated into the savored experience. It's no right. longer, oh, I've got to look at that. Oh, I've got to look at that. Suddenly, it's just part of a savored experience. And this transition from what are technically called vitaka, which is adverting to vikara, which is savoring, is the big moment in beginning to develop a calm state. Now, a calm state is not thought free. A calm state is not silent. Both of those ideas are totally mistaken. And they right. come about because people are stuck with adverting. And consequently, what I want my thoughts to stop. <laughs> what more sounds are going to say? It's not going to happen. We're always going to be thinking. Dark. I've got to sit in the Himalayas. All this ridiculous idea that somehow you've got to sit in some little box. This is all completely a mistake. You know, I just want to pause you for one second yeah, because sure. I love that you just said that because people have that misconception that they can go for backpacking in the Himalayas and they're going to come back completely transformed and mm -hmm. zen-like, right? I always like to challenge people. I'm like, what if you could be that in your everyday life? Then that would really be a tool. So I'm glad that you said that because I definitely wanted to highlight that for the listeners is that the whole point of this conversation is that you can, in just three minutes a day, start to be in a way, like how you said, you can experience everything without adverting or without so much disruption. I remember just for an example, when after I had been meditating for a while and things that used to bother me because I do have ADHD and stuff like that, so I could be distracted very easily, like sounds of the kids making too much noise or things like that. And I just remember one day, like sitting at the kitchen table, drinking coffee with my husband and all the sounds are going on and I wasn't tuning it out, but it was all just okay. And I didn't feel my blood pressure rise and I just was there in the environment. And I feel like that's kind of what you're saying. 
absolutely what you well of course so once you develop vicara you can stabilize a calm state what that means is that within experience you are calm you meditate you like can that. meditate with your eyes closed initially but ultimately you make sure to meditate with your eyes open because where we want to be calm is in the world there's no point in only being calm in a cave that is useless yeah. And indeed, I've met many meditators say, oh, I meditate eight hours a day. Oh, I meditate 10 hours a day. Oh, I meditate 12 hours a day. But when you meet them outside the meditation room, they are not calm. They have to go <laughs> back to meditating in order yes. to achieve calmness. I know what you're saying. That's, That's not going to get you anywhere. And so part of the three minute approach is to meditate where you are. I so if that. you're sitting at your desk, mm, sit there. Doesn't matter. In fact, there's a free app that goes with the book which you can download on a URL from the book. And the app is actually designed to give you the meditation instructions and you can just run them on your phone wherever you are. There's no oh, need that's great. I'm going to download it. Kind of trying. Now, there's another metaphor though that's really important. So as we're being adverted this way and that, we're being stressed and we're not resilient because we're being stressed. And the metaphor that's normally used is we're like a glass of water with chalk or dust in it and we're being stirred up. So we actually can't see clearly because the water is all stirred up. Makes As a lot of sense. As not to be reactive, the water settles all on its own. And what we achieve is what's called clear seeing or vipassana. Passana is seeing and v is clear. Vipassana is not really a meditation. Vipassana is the fruit of calm clarity. It's what happens when you're calm and clear, you vipassana. You could virtually make it a verb. And so the idea is you start seeing cool. clearly. You see you see the actuality of your experience for the first time. Mm. Now, we are not what we think we are. We're something quite different from what we think we are. But you can see the actuality of that in really quite short periods. If you just do three minutes, by the way, is a long time. If you do three minutes a day and you actually do the exercises, by the end of it, you will have a taste of actuality. That means you are a master of that element of actuality. You've actually made real progress. You've become an actual meditator. Now, the problem is, of course, that all the books, and we have thousands and thousands of books, and those books often come from Asian traditions, and the technical language they're using is entirely internal. Consequently, you can't pick up something and say, this is one of those. Right. The term is actually talking about some internal event. How are you ever going to truly understand what those terms mean? The Unless answer, you experience them. <laughs> you have to have experiences. So just like you can't say to someone, this is the taste of chocolate and give them an essay on chocolate, you've got to give them a piece of chocolate. In exactly the same way, you can't say to someone, this is meditation. Here's a 500 books on it. You've got to give them an experience of meditation. So that's what another thing that the three minute approach does. Very short, get an experience. Once you're inside with your own experience, then everything becomes possible. And so to me, this is a really important element. It's what emerged from the teaching. I realized more and more that people weren't embedding the words in themselves. And the only way they were ever going to do that is if it was really simple and really short. And I say, don't do more than three minutes. Just for this thing, just do three minutes. And the contract is simple. The instructions are straightforward. I will explain every single thing you're meant to do. And it's really simple. Just you do it for three minutes a day for seven days. Then there'll be another chapter and it'll be a different meditation on a different gate. Just read the instructions. They're really simple. They're all explained. Do the meditation for seven days, then go to the third chapter. So it's not a book to read that's got ideas in it. The idea is that you actually develop a series of insights. And what happens gradually over the course of the 14 weeks, even though it's only three minutes a day, is it accumulates. And suddenly people are going, yes. I, I'm meditating. I can see now what you're talking. I understand what you mean by this six gates business. I didn't really understand that before. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Because the meditation is being generated inside them. There's no one else, by the way, who's going to get enlightened. There's no it, one else <laughs> who's going to become a meditator. It's going to be you. And so yes. about it is going to get you nowhere. It's not inferential knowledge. It's yes. correct. I feel quite passionate about this because I think modernity is particularly challenging for humanity. And because we've been educated into this falsity that we are not real 
and there's some real thing out there that we're being told about, we are completely unable to deal with the increasingly complicated cultural change, technological change, yes. environmental change, and the consequent political changes that are literally overrunning our culture. Yeah. And the key to this is meditation. It is yeah. a you know, I couldn't agree more because what I feel, again, personal experience from meditating is that I got to know myself. And I mean that on a very deep and profound level. Mm -hmm. I was able to understand what my unique gifts, strengths, and talents were, how they want to be expressed. When we're not meditating and we're just in it, we have these fleeting moments where we're like, oh, yes, I have that gift, or I really love this passion, or I have this creative pursuit that I used to do, but I don't do anymore. And because we've conformed or whatever words you want to use for it. But meditation to me was almost like I say, like my return to radiance. It was my pathway back to myself. Absolutely. In fact, when you read biographies, so often you hear people say, I've had this very successful life. I've done all these amazing things, but really, I don't know what I was doing. And that's because they're very talented people, but they're actually following a program that had been given to them by their teachers or by yes. other people or whatever, by praise. And they land up living a life which is not them. And that, of course, is utterly tragic. There's an amazing word we have in our language. It's called a career. <laughs> we have a career. Of course, a we do. career is out of control. A career is not actually something you were doing. It's what's happening to you. You're careering. And that's the word. <laughs> it's so fascinating. English is full of little things like this. And you that's know, really so funny. There's, there's a recognition in our language. There's something fundamentally strange about what we're up to. And the key is we have to understand recognition. Now, understand is an interesting We have to stand under recognition. Now, when we stand under recognition, we see the map making. That's the recognitive process. And it is something we can see. And when we see the map making process, we're free of it. At that point, we become wise because suddenly we go, well, could do that, I guess, but you could do this. You have that freedom, yes. which is otherwise unavailable because we are instinctively reacting to the map. I actually call it reflexive reactivity. We're being reflexively triggered by a map about which we are unconscious. We don't realize it's happening. And it is happening 20 times a second. That's about the rate the map making is going on. And this is all neurophysiological. This isn't just meditation talk. Now we're talking about stuff that you can measure it's right. happening very, very, very rapidly. And so we're trapped in this very effective map making process, which enables us to learn from experience and has really taken a naked ape from the savannah to a Ferrari. It's a fantastic device, <laughs> but it's got a problem. It's paranoid. It's yes. not interested in your happiness. It's interested in your survival and it's based in the past. So consequently, we're always chasing our own tail doing what we know how to do better and better and better. But there may be something else that we never thought of that we're not doing at all. And of course, that's the tragedy of humanity. If you look at human history, it just goes round and round and round. We get better and better weapons, <laughs> but we go round and round and round. Yes. And they think, my God, this cannot continue. There's going to be something really unfortunate soon if we don't start going forward instead of going round and round and round. And this round and round and roundness, which is called samsara in the Asian traditions, is literally a function of unconscious map making. That's where it comes from. Yeah, that makes, that so makes a lot of sense. Right. Yeah. So I want to kind of like pivot the conversation a little bit, but going back to the three minutes. So one of when I first let's see, it was 2015, I think when I first started my Kundalini yoga certification. And one of the first meditations that they gave us was experimental for ourselves. So we could go within mm -hmm. and just see, but it was three minutes. It was a three minute meditation. And we had to close our eyes and meditate to our pulse. Mm -hmm. And that was it three minutes a day. And we That's had to good. do it for 30 days. And then they extended it another 60. So we ended up meditating on our pulse for 90 days. Very good. I can't tell you one, how easy it was in my busy life, but then two, mm -hmm. out of all the meditations and I've done lots of chanting ones and mm -hmm. I've done lots that still to this day is probably my go-to. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I had the most profound shift from that. Yeah, that's what I've not heard for because it's a sense of touch. Yes. Because you're feeling your pulse, but you're unconscious of it. 
So you learn to concentrate on the pulse and feel the pulse. That's a great meditation. I talk about touch of the nose, which is the Yeah, I saw nose. that. I like but that a lot you, too. You can take any sensation in the body and meditate on it. And you can meditate on the sound of your breath if you wanted to. We have all of these sensory impressions bombarding us. And mainly we just blank them out because we're in a map. So yes. all that matters is what's in the map. We don't care about anything else. All we care about is the map. And there's the problem. We are fundamentally disconnected. Yes, I find that. I would say that's the word. If I had to choose one word, what I feel we're suffering with the most is disconnection. Disconnection. Yeah, disembodiment. In yeah. fact, the French have a great phrase. They say, are you good in your own skin? Ooh. So cool. I can't say it in French. I always get it wrong. It's bien dans sa peau, I think. It's sa peau. But it means good in your own skin. Are you good in your own skin? If you're a multimillionaire with all these flashy things, but you're not good in your own skin, you've actually made no progress whatsoever. You're probably right. better. You're beggar. Because your own skin's all you've got. There's no point in pretending you own anything else. You really don't. So this is it. Are you good in your own skin? It's oh, really good. The oh, French actually are interesting. They have an art of living, which is being eroded now, unfortunately, by American influence. But it used to be this 15 years ago, the French would take an hour off for lunch routinely and they would never eat a sandwich at their desk. They were horrified by the idea that you would do that. Sit at your desk and eat. <laughs> Impossible. Yeah. You why would you do that? that. <laughs> You've got to go off and eat properly. And this was because they understand that being embodied is the actuality. Everything else is merely on top of it. And in many ways, our work-based culture has totally inverted this and has turned us into economic units whose only function is to produce. And we're told if we get a bunch of Rolex watches and nice cars, we've, quote, made it. Right. But what have we made? Nothing. Nothing. We've achieved. And Nothing. so the meditation process is not to throw that away. It's to contextualize it within a road to being good in your own skin. And once you're in your own skin and you're good in your own skin, then the world looks very, very different. And the whole that. idea of a spiritual quest becomes a nonsense. It is a nonsense. That is not what this is about. It's about becoming more and more presently embodied in your actual experience. That is the true path. And once that path opens, you realize you are your own master. You will make your own path. You will take advice from the great beings in the past and from the great beings you might meet in the present, but you will make your own path. And this is a path to meaning that is real, not meaning you get from a book that you can quote to other people. It's something quite different. It's really surprising. And the spiritual path isn't going this way. It's going this way. Yes. And we can't see it because it's not visible. We see everything in terms of good, bad, happy, sad, rich, poor, fame, all these things, tick tock, tick tock. The actual path is this way going somewhere totally different. And I, I, we open that door, we see it. I love so much that you talked about like the path to meaning because that's a conversation that's really up for me right now. I'm still in, in corporate America and I work with a lot of leaders. And you know, once you get to like an executive leader, which you were at one point too, that's where they're sitting. They're like, I have all this success and all these things, but I don't feel like I have meaning. I don't feel like I have fulfillment. And what was all of this for? What's it all for? Absolutely. What's it all for? Yet Being Someone Other is the name of a biography by Lawrence van der Post. Such a cool title, Yet Being Someone Other. At the end of his life, he realized he was actually someone else. In fact, just recently, Michael Parkinson, who's a very famous TV presenter in the UK, like the kind of news anchor kind of guy, he also came onto the BBC and said, I, was not, I wasn't this. This isn't me at all. Wow. What I spent my career doing isn't me. And people are going, what? What do you mean it's not you? <laughs> what are you talking about? You've been so successful. But the answer is we live in this map. And unless we understand the map, we are not ourselves. We're just in a robotic. And of course, the map is mechanical. Let's be clear here. This map is mechanical. It's based upon memory of prior events, which are laid on top of current circumstance and are, quote, known. And what yes. happens is we match up between our previous memory and what's how I know it's one of those. Now, that is a mechanical process. And Google with the A logarithms and now chat GBT, they will mimic that map and they will sound human. Oh yeah, they do. It's I use chat GPT all the time and, I, yeah, it, and, it, sounds and it starts to know my voice because I've yeah. put in like my own writing and now it spits back to me in my voice. And I'm like, this is really cool, but also yeah. but kind of know, scary. What, it, what's so interesting <laughs> when you look at it is it's this deep. You yes. suddenly, once you start developing a taste for this, you can see that the language that's being used 
He's very smooth. He's yes. very nice, but he's very shallow. Yes. And that's agree. where you start realizing, oh, there's no one here. There's no one behind this. This is just correlation. Now, the thing is, the map is just correlation. It's inherently meaningless. So even if your map takes you to a position of great success or takes you to a position of great sadness, it's inherently meaningless. The suffering yes. is real, but the map is not. And there's the tragedy of the human condition. And once you see that, you become what, what's called compassionate because yes. you suddenly realize, boy, people are really messing up their lives for nothing. That's the true generation of compassion. Then you go, boy, I wish I could help. This is so crazy. Yes, that's kind of where I'm at in my journey now too, is I'm trying to help people. And I'm so glad you're on the show too, because I think at the end of the day, like my current intention is to help people come back to themselves and have more meaning and have more fulfillment. I'm 44. I've lost both my parents. And I can't say that when they passed away, that they felt completely fulfilled. And that just made me sad. I can tear saying that. And I was like, I want to have a different life. I want to be able when it's my time to pass with that fulfillment and feeling like my life had meaning and that I was able to do two things. Like one, like really express myself. Like I know self-expression for me is like my form of creativity or like my gift. And so did I allow myself that joy yeah. of co-creating with myself in the universe and my strengths, talents, and then yeah. also, did I get a chance to make an impact? Did I get a chance to have connection, like true connection in my relationship? So I don't know if my perception will change as I go on my journey, but that's currently where I'm at right now is like, those are there's the things that are really there's important. There's something really, really interesting here too. Unfortunately, people's goodwill gets mapped by them into what they call charity. Uh -huh. say, oh, I'm going to sign a check for this charity, sign a check for that charity. It's all going to be good. I'm doing my good thing. Oh, you're going down a rabbit hole that I learned a hard lesson on. Go. <laughs> well, I, you know, one of my Buddhist teachers said to me, look, charity must come from your own hand. That is where charity is. Signing a check and giving it to somebody is not charity. That's just a form of investment. And... When you're charitable, it must be from your own hand. And this, again, is a fundamental realization that our embodiment is primary. Yes. And really and... where we're going to find meaning is there. And then Not you talk about this world. mapping and I learned a lesson the hard way. I've always wanted to make a difference, make positive right. change. Like I've always had a drive oh. for impact, but there is a time in my life several years ago, probably seven, eight years ago now where the map was controlling me, meaning I was working for an organization. I'm a senior leader. The mantra of the company was people before profits. Now that matched my heart. What I didn't understand <laughs> then that I understand now is that because it was good deed or like charitable, like good cause, I ended up sacrificing my well-being. I sacrificed my time with my family. And then I realized I'm like, oh my gosh, like it took me falling apart and putting myself back together, by the way, for me to realize this. But one of my profound takeaways was you can't sacrifice yourself for a belief because it's not even real. Like here I am, I dedicated three years of my life to this cause that ended up, I had a nervous breakdown. I got autoimmune disease. I was really sick. I had to heal. And for what? <laughs> right. And anyway, so I think that's a good example of the map too, or how you can, there's this illusion sometimes like of charity or goodwill that can still uh, have like a saboteur effect if you're not really in. No, we teach, you know, I, I teach in this college called Dharma College in Berkeley, and we teach a number of different courses and one's on self-care because really working with your own experience is a form of self-care. Yes. And we don't care for ourselves enough. We're always beating ourselves up saying, oh, you've got to perform. You've got to be out there performing. It's a complete misunderstanding. Oh, uh, you just gave me really the goosebumps. It's our own self-care. Yes. That really matters. And it's not being selfish. Because funny enough, when you care for yourself, you become compassionate to others. Because you realize that they're not caring for themselves. And that's true compassion. To see someone who's making a mistake and help them get over it is true compassion. It's wow. not charity. It's compassion. And compassion comes from that insight. And that insight comes from self-care. And that self-care ultimately has to be based on understanding who we are. And that has to be based on seeing the sixth sense gates. It all is connected. Yeah, all that interconnectedness. Yeah, it's connected together in a series of things. Yeah. So yeah. we are coming down to the 30 minutes. I knew this was going to fly by, but I would, it is the empowered half hour. So I always like to ask, 
if someone took these concepts of meditating three minutes a day on their six senses, downloaded your app, read your book, how would it empower their lives? How would it change? Well, okay. They would see their life for the first time is the answer. Maybe only just for fleeting moments. But once you see the actuality of your experience, everything changes. Everything. Now you can learn a new skill. You can learn a new technique and something changes. When you see the actuality of your life, everything changes. It is as big as that. There is no bigger thing you can do. Now, meditation should be taught in primary schools along with reading and writing. Should be reading, writing and meditation should be the two R's and an M. And it isn't. It's a very simple skill. It's like learning to play golf or learning to play the violin. It is not a complicated skill. But once you've developed it even a little bit, everything changes. And you're able to ask questions about what you're doing, who you are, what matters to you, what would actually improve the world. All of these big questions become askable because finally you're in touch with experience itself, not with ideas about experience, which is what the map gives you. You make this fundamental shift in being. And I've seen that happen on so many. We, we have over I have thousands of, of testimonials of people saying, now, this is not, oh, I've discovered a new thing. Ah, not at all. It's, wow, I see where this begins. I've seen that. the beginning. And once you see the beginning, you are truly in a position to make change. You can decide, OK, this is not such a good idea for me or this is something I ought to be doing. You get that kind of insight that comes from Vipassana you start to see clearly. And if there's one thing I feel, it's that. And I promise you in 14 weeks, you're going to get a little glimpse of that. If you read the book and think just by reading the book, you'll get that benefit. You won't. You have to do the work. (laughs) You have to work. And it's so little. It's literally, it's it's under five hours in total. But each day, it's less than the time it takes to drink a cup of coffee. And you do it any time. You don't have to say, I've got to do this at quarter to seven in the morning. Any time you want, you do this. And the effect will just like a dripping tap gradually accumulate a capacity. And the capacity you have is to know yourself. They can't I love be that so much. Of knowing yourself, really. That's got and, to be more uno. Yeah. And I know that we're at the bottom of our time. And listeners, I know I try to keep this to 30 minutes, but I have to ask you one more question because I don't get to ask too many meditation teachers this who have a philosophy of eyes open meditation. Can we talk about that for a second? Because I think most of the listeners do feel that they have to, you know, again, I kind of opened it up, but like when I'm working meditation with clients for the first time, they're like, what kind of cushion do I need? You know, do I need candles? Do I need this? Do I need that? I'm like, no, actually you could just do it anywhere. But I never really get to have a conversation about eyes opened meditation. So I would like on the shorter side, so we can keep it closer to a half hour. But what are your thoughts on that? Okay. We are biologically predators. That's to say eyes front, little ears. Cows, eyes on the side, big ears. Because prey animals have to have 360 vision and hear everything. Predators need to vision. They need vision, focus. So everything's on the front. Everything's at the front. That means our visual sense is very strong. And the map making that is associated with the visual sense is particularly quick. Because if you see pointy ears in the bushes, you've got to say, saber tooth tiger, run. You've no time to think, oh, that's nice looking. <laughs> Get the hell out of it. And so the <laughs> sense is very, very strong. So beginners, when they are learning to be less reflexively reactive, simplify their sense fields. And one of the normal things to do is close the eyes because we're so reactive to visual input. Our reflexive reactivity is particularly marked in the visual field. So you start off by meditating with your eyes closed. However, as you become familiar with the difference between vitaka and vikara, as you stabilize your calmness, so you can open your eyes and not react to what you see. And at that mm. point, it's extremely valuable because what we really are looking to achieve is a calm state in which the senses are open and the mind is active, oh, i.e. Wow. we are fully embodied. If we can only meditate with our eyes closed, in a quiet room, in a static position, we are not embodied. We're in a little narrow box of our total embodiment. So the goal is to become fully embodied. And that means every sense is open 
but we're not like we normally are. We uh -huh. would just be profound if we do that. Then, of course, we learn from our open senses and we learn from our thoughts. Our thoughts are not an enemy. Our thoughts are just playing scenarios and doing this and that. We can say, oh, that's interesting or that's not interesting or whatever. We don't care. They're not going to hurt us. Anything more than our visual senses will hurt us. Mm. So that's why ultimately meditate with your eyes open. But only when you've learned non-distraction. Sure. You're still being distracted by all means. Close your eyes. But do not think that there's some inner world that you're going to discover some Xanadu somewhere in there that you're going to go and live. You live here. And everybody lives here. This is it, here. It's not anywhere else. You know, this is such an important point. It's here. It's okay. this mind here. And that means sense is open, mind open. And we get that. And it's just a matter of becoming familiar with non-reactivity. And as you do, by savoring sense experience, instead of immediately bouncing off it, saying, oh, I know what that is, or I don't want that, or whatever. Once we begin to just calmly savor sense experience, this, in, this expansion becomes possible and we achieve what you rightly call radiance suddenly we are the radiant center of knowing in this array that is being given to us this incredible incarnation that we have these extraordinary sensory capacities this incredible mind all the riches of imagination are all available to us as a gift that is the true fruit of a human being that is the human potentiality itself and once you've made contact with that, you have found the pot of gold, the proverbial pot of gold you always thought was at the end of the rainbow. It turned out to be right here, about 400 milliseconds from your nose the whole time. And that's where the door opens and you go, wow, wow. now I've got everything. I finally made it back. Wow. What a great way to wrap it up. I have goosebumps from head to toe. Such a powerful episode. Listeners, I hope you really are able to take away how profound just three minutes a day can be when you engage your senses and just allow the experience to be your <laughs> experience, right? Richard, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you.